with uh, Julie. I spoke with Julie earlier this week, last week, whenever, about you know where you where you guys all start with with cooling towers and and I and and it can make it very technical, but I've tried to keep it very simple, uh, knowing that we've got what I believe are freshmen all the way to folks that are pursuing their PhDs in this group, right? So this is level 101 intro to intro to cooling towers. Uh, and it's really geared towards the freshmen, sophomore, juniors in there. So, so the folks that are more advanced, uh, bear with me. We can take your technical questions and challenge you next week as much as you want. Um, here we are, Beijing Olympics. You know, we've all heard about the, the big scandal. If everyone's been complaining about this industrial backdrop, but what you see in the backdrop are not nuclear reactors, they're just cooling towers, okay? Uh, that, that's what they are. As much as anybody wants to convince you that they're something else, they are cooling towers. Now, they may be cooling towers for a nuclear facility, but those big things are just cooling towers. Um, so what is a cooling tower doing? So let's, let's make this simple. All of you, and I'm gonna ask for volunteer participation here. So either speak up or I will call on you. You've all probably dealt with a puddle of water in your house, right? Or dropped a puddle of water on the floor, right? Drop a glass of water. What do you do when you spill water? What are the two ways to make it dry? Put a towel on it. <laughs> Put a towel on it. Okay, let's say you don't want to waste a paper towel on it. What are you going to do? What's the other thing you'll do on it? To make it dry. Put a fan can. behind it. Okay, fan behind it. Very good. What's the other thing you... So you put a fan and that puddle is going to dry. How could you accelerate the drying using the fan? Add heat. Add heat. That's one way. So that, that air is adding heat. What's another thing you could do to that puddle of water? Add velocity. To what? The air. The the, yeah. Okay. Okay, you guys are missing the most basic thing you do. Seems like none of you have used the model. Spread it out into small droplets. Spread it out. There we go. You are now a pro on cooling towers. Those are the two things you do when you're doing it with a cooling tower. You spread the water out and you put a fan on it. Cooling tower for you. But very simply, that's all a cooling tower is doing. It is spreading the water out and it is blowing air across it. And when you do those two things, it evaporates it. Okay. It, and what does evaporating do? What happens when you evaporate something off your skin? You what do it. you feel? You cool it. There you go. You got the cooling tower part of it now. Now let's put all of that in a box. Okay. We'll get there. So how hot is this guy? Come on. A little bit of snickers and smiles out there. What's this person? Smoking. He's smoking. There we go. Well, I kind of cropped this image from here. What is this guy trying to do? This is really where that image comes from. This is from the British Red Cross. We all know we had a heat wave this year and the previous year and the previous year. And this is what the British Red Cross was telling people to do. Wet your shirt. Wear wet your shirt. Dip it in water and wear it. How many of you have been on a lake, jumped into the, in, on a boat on a lake, jumped into the lake, come back out of the lake, sat there in your shirt and that boat starts speeding and you feel really cold? You see some, some nods? Generally, you're on the lake when it's about 100 degrees outside, right? That's when you want to be on the lake, wakeboard in or surfing or whatever you're doing. But you feel cold. Why is that? Why are you feeling cold at that point in time? The evaporating water takes energy from you. There you go. And how cold are you going to feel? What is the physical limitation of how cold you're going to feel? Based on the latent uh, heat of the water. There, there we go. You're getting close. 
And what is that phenomenon called? So latent heat is one way, it's evaporating. How many of you have heard of the term wet bulb temperature? Okay. Wet bulb temperature is the theoretical coldest you can feel at a certain given dry bulb temperature. So you have a dry bulb temperature and a humidity, right? And wet bulb is the coldest that you can make that water use it by blowing air across it, okay? That's, that's wet bulb in a nutshell. So you're gonna feel as cold, and Andrew, you were nodding as you were sipping your coffee, so I'm gonna take on you. You're gonna feel as cold as the dry bulb temperature and the wet bulb temperature where they coincide, the dry bulb temperature and the relative humidity coincide with the wet bulb temperature. That, that is called a psych, psychrometric study. Psychrometrics, we can spend a whole day a whole semester or 16 all years understanding psychrometrics and its applications, Julie nods out there. Uh, but if you understand psychrometrics, you understand cooling towers really well. And what this, the reason they were telling folks to wear a wet t-shirt was so that they would have this apparent feeling of it being colder than it really was in England, right? And, and, and you've got to keep in mind in England, 100 degrees has never been experienced. They don't have air conditioning, kind of like Canada uh, this past year in 2021. They're just not used to, and their homes are not designed for that. So 100 degrees sounds like nothing for us in Utah. We're all used to it. But when you go up to places where they don't have air conditioning and they're not used to it, you start to have a heat stroke. So this was basically application of psychrometrics to keep the people from dying in England. Nothing about there. So all of you are familiar with a dry bulb temperature. This was 100 degrees, right around there, Fahrenheit, 40 Celsius. Let's say it was 25% humid. Okay, so this is your typical Utah Lake day, right? In July, 100 degrees, 25 humid. You jump out of that lake, get into the boat, and you start going fast. How cold are you gonna feel? You're going to feel the wet bulb temperature, and that is going to be roughly 70 degrees. 70 degrees is kind of cold, right? 70 degrees feels kind of nippy, especially if you're in a boat. You're going to feel a little nippy, a little light jacket is what you want, late spring. So carrying on with that, this is how wet bulb temperature is measured. This is old school. Most of you may never see a device like this. They're too young. This is back in the days where we had eight, eight, eight cassette tapes. You have a, two thermometers. All seen one of these, right? Julie, you have. Everyone seen a, seen an old school mercury thermometer? I broke a bunch. It's not good. It's not good. There's mercury in them. <laughs> okay. So what this is, is an old school sling psychrometer. And you have one that is taking the dry bulb temperature, as you can see, and the other is the exact same thing, but it's got a little wetted wick on it, right? It's just a little cotton wrapped around it. You dip this in water, you hold this handle, and you spin it in the air. Velocity, right? You're spinning it in the air, you're giving it velocity. And what you'll find is that you'll have a dry bulb reading, 80 or 90 degrees, whatever it is. You don't know the humidity, and you'll have the wet bulb temperature. And that's going to change from place to place, right? So a lot of you have also heard that evaporative cooling works in Utah, but doesn't work in Florida. Why does it not work in Florida? Humidity is too high. Humidity is too high. So cooling towers take advantage of that fact. So in Utah, cooling towers is a lot better than it would be in Florida. And, and that's a great way to reject heat. So, so really quick, yeah. I think your microphone might be rubbing on your shirt and kind of okay. You want me to be the hot guy and take out my shirt? Yeah. <laughs> no, just move the microphone away. <laughs> okay. Uh, so let's get to you modern kids. This is an app. Okay, you don't have to spin a thermometer like that. You get a Munter's Psycro app. This is the one that 
I have my entire team use. There's a hundred different apps. This is really neat little app. Put it on your phone, download it for free. It's a fantastic little tool. Uh, remember, you have to adjust for altitude, just as we do with everything in, in air conditioning and uh, in, in energy, you have to account for that. But you put in your dry bulb temperature, your relative humidity, and it'll give you your wet bulb temperature very quickly. Sonny, have you ever tested this against with a sling? I have not. I, I don't have a sling. I wish I did. Is that right? Interesting. <laughs> but I have tested this app against uh, actual measurements in a cooling tower, which is, if, and, and it's been pretty spot on. So uh, yes, this app does, does hold its weight against real life applications. Um, I do this test all the time. I basically pop open the app. I see what the sump temperature should be theoretical. And if I'm within a few, I know I've got it there. So I check the efficiency of the cooling tower using this app all the time. So the dry bulb temperature is 72, relative humidity 35, pretty typical Utah day. Uh, the wet bulb temperature is 54 as the output, right? 54 feels pretty cold. This is not a fun day on the lake. This is why you don't jump into the lakes in April and May. You only wait till June or July till it gets to those hundreds. Just to illustrate how wet bulb changes. So the first example was 100 degrees, 25%. Second example, 72, 35%. And let's go to the third example, 52 and 35%. So we're keeping the percent humidity the same but changing just the dry bulb between example two and example three. Moving along, you'll see you can get 39 degrees theoretical, okay? That's how cold you can get that water. So a cooling tower is basically taking advantage of this property along with the mop and the fan and it brings everything into a box, right? And, and that's why you call it a cooling tower. You could, you could do this any way you want, you know, gigantic cooling tower or, 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 a, or a home, you will achieve these same conditions. Any questions so far on wet bulb temperature? This is a lot of technical material being dumbed down and presented very quickly. So does anybody have a question about wet bulb temperature and what it feels like to you? I just wanted to make a connection maybe for people. So a cooling tower and a swamp cooler are the same thing. <laughs> just when he says that if this is in a house, that's because he's talking about a swamp cooler. It doesn't have the like waterfall kind of thing that a cooling tower does, but the effect is basically the same. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Yeah, the, the effect is the same. The underlying principles are the same. It's just uh, what you're doing on one side of it is different, right? Okay. And at KW Engineering, we have a little thing we call Pat Engineering. Pat's one of our engineers. And uh, it, it basically goes to say every piece of HVAC equipment describes itself. So what does an air compressor do? Compresses air. What does a condenser do? Condenses. What does a cooling tower do? It cools. It's all you need now, to do. <laughs> we weren't very creative as mechanical engineers or, you know, in naming things. It's pretty, pretty simple like that. Uh, so now getting into it. So this is what a cooling tower is. You take all those three concepts that we talked about, spreading the water, speeding it up, and wet bulb temperature, and you package it and you got yourself a cooling tower. So what happens in a cooling tower is water that you want to cool, right? Whether, and, and that is heat that the water has picked up. So heat that the water has picked up from any process application, okay? It comes in here and it goes across this packing material or heat exchange media. And that's just increasing the surface area. There's nothing magical about it. It's simple plastic in most cases. In a swamp cooler, it's a, it's a, it's a pad of some kind, right? It, it could be, it could even be a cotton bed sheet for all I care, right? It, it just increases the surface area as if you're, make, you're, you're mopping the water around, right? 
So that water comes down this way and, and, and then it will fall into this sump. Now, as this water is falling, the air gets accelerated, that dry air, 72 degrees with 25% humidity or 100 degree air with 72, 25% gets accelerated through that media. It's going through that media. And when you, in a couple of pictures, you'll see it. And this air gets pulled by a fan. So the fan, the faster you spin it, velocity, someone mentioned, faster you spin it, higher the velocity, the more air is going through here, the faster it picks up that heat. In doing so, yes, some water is lost. It gets evaporated. But what happens is it picks up that heat and that water gets cooled down to the wet bulb temperature, right? And that water goes up and, that, and so the air coming out here is definitely more humid than it was going in. So going in, it was coming in at 25%. Here it's probably coming out at 80, 85%. So you all see those plumes of clouds when you drive past the refineries uh, in, in Salt Lake, right? And everyone is talking, oh, that, that looks like fumes. Well, those big plumes are nothing but vapor. Those are vapor. The real toxic stuff you can't see. That's the stuff coming out of the higher chimney stacks. Okay. Um, and so, so the water, so that plume is over here. That's what you're seeing, that big white cloud. Air goes here. This remaining water that did not evaporate comes down in the sump and is cool. It's, it's cool, as cold as the wet bulb temperature. Theoretically, the coldest this water can get is the wet bulb temperature. Now, of course, in reality, nothing works to theoretical efficiency. So it tends to be a little bit warmer than the wet bulb temperature. Sorry, my kids are screaming. Um, so you have this wet bulb temperature over here wet bulb, cold, chilled out water, this water now goes back and goes back to the process that you're trying to cool, whatever that process is. Of course, the water that you evaporated out of here, you have to make up, and that is make up water that you bring in just from a faucet, right? A tap, whatever, lake, well, whatever you want to do. That's what goes on in a cooling tower. Okay, any questions? What, uh, how much warmer than the okay. theor theoretical is like a tip off for the cooling tower not being uh, working T properly? Typically 10 degrees is what I say. So as long as the water coming out here is about 10 degrees warmer than the wet bulb temperature, your cooling tower is doing well. They are, industry standard is 13 degrees. With certain additions and designs, you can get it as close as six degrees on a fully loaded condition. So and that's called the approach temperature. Thank you, Michael. Yep, that, that, that's called approach. So how close this gets to the theoretical is the approach. Typically, if you're in that 10-ish range, uh, you're doing really well. Now that approach of 13 is based off a design condition. So you're gonna say, you know, on a hundred degree day in Utah, when the humidity is 40%, right? Can it achieve 13 degrees? Now you may go out there and find it's hundred degrees, but the humidity is only 15%. So it's going to be less than that. So that's why I say, if you're with around 10, you're in good shape. And if you're at 20, there's a problem. If you're at three, double check your readings. May, and it's very possible you may be at three just based on the ambient conditions. But if you're at 20, your cooling tower offers you an opportunity for energy efficiency, okay? Does this work more effectively in more humid climates then? No, it works more effectively in dry climates. What do you do to a cooling tower to get it to behave more efficient, efficiently? Is it like better packing and a bigger fan or? We'll, we'll get there in a second. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So here are examples of cooling towers. 
these all, no matter their size, work on the same principle, water going in, water coming out. This is just a big industrial cooling tower. Uh, here's a more typical one. You'd see this more likely on campuses at the U or somewhere. Uh, you, you, you see these little conical things. If they don't have, the, adding these helps with, uh, with lowering that approach that Michael talked about. Like these, are, these are certain additions that, that you can do, velocity recovery stacks. There are there is other things we can get, we'll get to, okay? This is an old school cooling tower seen on the roofs of many small buildings. In fact, the St. Anne's Church at a near our office on 2100 South, if you drive on 500 East going South, uh, from 2100 South to like 2600 South, you'll see this on the St. Anne's Church up there. No different. There is nothing fundamentally different between that puppy and that puppy. Okay, you got a fan, you got a fan. You got air in, entering in, you got air entering in. You got water spilling over. Here, you, that's all that's happening. They're all the same, okay? And lastly, the ones from the nuclear plant, these tend not to have a fan, but their conical design and their gigantic structure causes the water to drip on these. So these just don't have a fan, but they're effectively using chimney stack effect to get the air to go through it this way, picking up that plume of wet, cloud that you see right there. And you can see that it's got the opening there. So this is just using a natural chimney effect to get that water, the air to go. Maybe they have a gigantic fan. I believe they don't. So Cody, Julie, correct me if I'm wrong here, Mariah. But I believe these don't generally have a fan and they're just using stack effect to get that air to go through. But all you're trying to do in a cooling tower is move air from down to up and get that water to cool down. Okay, nothing different. Okay, that is not a nuclear plume. Nobody is dying out there, Trey and Nate. Nobody is dying over there. Okay, no one's glowing. All the all the skiers and snowboarders are coming home with no glow. Okay, so moving along, here's one of my funnest uh, cooling tower experiences. I show you the movie Hot Tub Time Machine. Many of you may have seen it. Maybe you're too young. Look at that bottom, it looks like a wooden hot tub. This was actually, see the similarity? This is actually a cooling tower that I saw on the roof of a building in Boise, Idaho. It is made of wood. I kid you not, this is made of wood. It had a fan over here and it was a bottom sump. This cooling tower, believe it or not, was running just as efficient and giving me the wet bulb temperature with the eight degree approach that many steel structured Marley cooling towers I have not been able to get. And this really highlighted for me, the maintenance side of that media, of that packing material, right? The, this tower was pristinely maintained. If you looked in the sump, there was, there was not a lot of dirt. There was not a lot of feathers. There's not a lot of leaves. It was on the top of a 20 story building. So that of course helped that cause. It didn't pick up all the dirt and debris from, from the road or from the side. And, and so I, I always bring this picture up since I got it to highlight that it did not come down to the physical structure of the tower, the media. This is made out of wood. It's a 23 year old tower, but maintained really well runs better than some towers I've seen that look really good, but are maintained terribly. So maintenance is key in the performance of a cooling tower, okay? So here's what that media looks like. This helps increase the surface area. All, all that's happening is the water just goes over here and you can see how the air will flow through it, right? And here's the top of it with a fan on top of it. That's what it looks like, right? So we're, we're back to spreading the water and increasing the fan velocity across it. Nothing more to it. Any questions in the chat? No, not, none yet. Okay. Maybe one quick question is how are cooling towers maintained? What are some basics? Okay, perfect. Let's jump there. 
So here's another picture. This is another one I took from inside of a cooling tower. You can look at that fan. Got to make sure. So some of the fans are belt driven, some are direct driven, right? This actually had a gear system in it. You want to make sure that your, firstly, your media is well maintained, right? That, that your media is clean and clear. And in about three pictures, I will show you what scaling can look like. Uh, you want to make sure that those nozzles that are spraying that water, so that water that's coming from the top, right? That upper pipe is actually spraying properly. If those nozzles are not spraying and they act like a faucet, you're not going to get that spreading effect. So you want to make sure that those nozzles are clean. And if you look at the shower head in your bathroom, you'll see that on the shower head, you may have a little bit of like, if you, if you press on it, you may get a little ring of white material on it. It's just the, 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 the solids in dissolved solids slowly scaling up on your shower head. You can just with your thumb, move them out. That happens to nozzles. Your shower has basically a collection of nozzles, right? So if you, if you see that, just take that 10X and now you've got that happening there. They use, your jacket's trying to talk again. Uh, they use chemical to treat that water. So there is a chemical that is added to it. Uh, that's gonna be there on site. So that way they keep the pH and, and all of that and the water treated. Make sure your fans are operating freely, no squeaky belts, no broken blades. Uh, next slide, I'll show you what happens to uh, that. Make sure you have good air circulation. This is one that you see, you see they build a tower. Let's say they build one building and they put a tower there, right? And then in comes the next developer and squeezes in on that tower, right? Puts another building there, maybe encircles it, or the neighbor said, oh, that thing looks too ugly. You build a fence around it. When you do that, you're restricting the airflow through that tower, through that media. And when you restrict that airflow, you've lost some of that, that efficiency. You cannot have a restricted cooling tower. So, so it's really important to make sure that your cooling towers are positioned in a way that will not restrict, restrict airflow. And if it is getting restricted, and you observe that on site, you need to address that. You know, and that could be perforating that metal screen, uh, changing that metal screen somehow, perforating it, raising the, raising the cooling tower a little bit above ground so it has a little bit more airflow. Uh, there is a phenomenal presentation by a gentleman named uh, Kankari, K-A-N-K-H-A-R-I, where he has shown using CFD modeling, and I'll send you guys that link of how if you stack like three cooling towers in a row, like let's go back here, like this tower, this bank, how potentially one tower can steal air from another tower. So if you have like a series of cooling towers, depending on how they're oriented, it can steal air from one tower to another tower and thereby reduce the efficiency of one tower significantly. And, and so you come there and you're like, I, I got 400 tons of cooling tower capacity spread between three towers. And then you actually find out, no, you only have, you know, 320 tons because that 80 tons is being lost to airflow. So if you see a bank of cooling towers stacked very close to each other, that might be something you want to think about. That, of course, is taking it to the next level of cooling towers and analysis and capital improvement. But there's a fantastic video animation of, of that happening uh, by Mr. Kankari. And I'll send you guys that link. Sonny, we've got two questions in the chat. OK. Um, Julie, do you want to ask that? Oh, we can wait on that. I don't want to get off track, but I just wanted to note it. But how about Trey and Nathaniel's? Okay. Um, Trey and Nathaniel's question is, is there a good way to tell if there's good or bad circulation? Um, check your sump temperatures. So let's say you have um, three, are you talking multiple towers or single tower, Nick? Trey? Just kind of in general. 
because I don't know what good air circulation would look like versus bad. Make sure you got 10 feet around all sides of the cooling tower. That's one way. If it's a standalone isolated cooling tower, uh, cooling tower manufacturers provide a specification of how much gap should be there between that, you know, spacing on all four sides. Make sure you're, you're meeting or exceeding that. That's going to be one way. If everything looks good, your media looks nice, your fan is spinning right, and you take a wet bulb reading and you're like at 20 instead of 10 approach, that's an indication you may have bad airflow. Okay, so that wet bulb thing, it's a good little trick to have in your back pocket. It really can help you diagnose a tower very quickly and very, uh, uh, you know, for what the issues might be. So moving on here. So here's cooling towers that don't work. These are actual pictures from my camera on site. The fan blade is gone. Nobody knew about this till we actually climbed on top of the tower. The fan motor was spinning. But if you lose three of these impellers, as you can tell out here, they cracked. You don't have airflow. A fan is not efficient if three of its impellers are, are broken out of five, right? It's like trying to fly an airplane with, without an impeller out there. It's not going to take off. The same concept. That's going to impact your airflow. So even if this tower was perfectly maintained, pristine condition, you would not meet your approach because you don't have that velocity, that airflow. On the other side, that is bad media. That is media that has got everything under the sun. Chemical treatment is bad. You may have mold. You can cause all kinds of issues with that. If your media looks like this, change it. This is not very expensive. It is not very expensive in Utah to recondition a cooling tower because largely speaking, we don't have a lot of rust out here, right? So when you take out the rusting of the basin, I mean, even look at this, you can see the media is trashed, but there's not a lot of rust. So your steel box is in actually pretty good condition. Change out the media, three, $4,000. Condition the fan, make sure your fan's working right. You got yourself a brand new cooling tower. It's as easy as that. It's not very expensive in Utah to get a cooling tower running again. James, you had a question? No, sorry, I just scratched my ear. Okay. Uh, so that's how you get cooling towers to work right. Uh, did I answer that question, uh, Jake or Andrew, you had about how to make sure cooling towers are maintained? Okay. So here's, this is not from a cooling tower. No, this, this is from a fluid cooler. A fluid cooler is a cooling tower, a closed loop cooling tower, okay? A, a, basically what I mean in there is that instead of just pouring water over, not uh, trying to cool it, you actually are trying to cool some fluid that cannot be exposed to the air. So this happens, let's say if you had milk, you were trying to cool milk, right? Milk comes out at a dairy farm, it's coming out 98 degrees, milk's a living thing, comes out, it goes through a stainless steel tube bundle inside of a cooling tower box. Water is sprayed on it, you try to cool the milk, and, and water falls on the outer surface of this tube bundle inside of a cooling tower. If you have a closed loop tube bundle inside of a cooling tower, it's called a fluid cooler. Milk being the fluid you're cooling, sulfuric acid, ammonia, whatever you want, right? There's nothing to it. Now, in that case, what was happening is the water was so bad, and you can see a very smooth, perfect curve over here. Kind of looks like it was on top of a tube. And this is the calcium building or whatever solids building on top of it. So what was happening on this tube bundle was that water is spraying on top of it over here and it's never hitting the tube. As a result, the fluid was never being cooled because all that was happening was this sediment was getting thicker and thicker and thicker. 
right? This is actually in Northern Utah at a, at a plant. The water was so bad out there that we converted, we recommended converting a 4,000 ton cooling tower to air cooled because this had happened within a year to two years on that tube bundle. Now, fluid coolers tend to be 6X the price of a cooling tower by default. So this, this manufacturer had replaced their cooling towers every three years for the last 15 years because their tube bundles were going so bad. And the alternative was to use reverse osmosis filtered water in order to do that. And if you do an energy balance out there, RO water, it uses three gallons of tap water to make one gallon of RO water. So when they did a cost benefit analysis, going air cooled solved the problem. It increased the longevity of their equipment. It got rid of this. They didn't have to put an RO plan and, and that's what they did. So I have seen this. This is actually my, my hand out here holding this piece. We actually converted that to that. So again, you know, cooling towers are great, fantastic application but you have to also be aware of the water quality you're getting on, on, your fluid, on your cooling tower, on your fluid cooler. You have to make sure your airflow is good, your fan is maintained. All of those things are in good shape. That's, that's high level on cooling towers. And I'm on to my last slide. So cooling towers in a nutshell, they're governed by the laws of nature, okay? I cannot change psychrometrics for you. That's physics, right? That's like gravity, you're gonna fall. I'll go to the moon otherwise. Okay, that's wet bulb temperature. That is defined by physics. It's in a psychrometric chart. Cooling towers can only deliver water as cold as the wet bulb temperature. You cannot get colder than that. This is a trap. A lot of people say, oh, if I put more cooling towers, I'll get colder water. No, you will get more water at that wet bulb temperature. You will not get colder water. You cannot get colder water. I have had to nix many, many projects in my career where they wanted to put five cooling towers instead of three saying, we'll get colder water. Nope. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, no, you will get more water at that same temperature. So yes, you can exchange more BTUs because you're doing more GPMs, but you're not going to do it with the same GPMs. And there's a penalty of moving more water. So, so a lot of times you wanna be a little careful with that. If they need 40 degree water and your wet bulb condition only gets you to 44, adding more cooling towers is not going to get you to 40 degree water. You will still be at 44. That is the, if there's nothing else you take from today, that is the one thing you need to get is that you are limited by wet bulb temperature. You cannot get colder than that. And typically it's plus 10 for your sanity check during an audit. If you're plus 10, plus eight, plus 13, you're in that ballpark. If you're plus 20, you got an opportunity. That's it for me. So open to questions, feedback, comments. Hopefully Julie, I addressed all the needs of a cooling tower. So Sunny, what are, are there any other big opportunities that they could look for on site audits um, that are red flags or opportunities? Actually, I'll, I'll uh, tag on to James' question. Sunny, I suspect next week in particular, you might see some presentations either around, uh, around BFDs, either on cooling tower fans or on uh, uh, distribution pumps. Um, so if you'd comment on that. Okay, so let's go back to that schematic. So let's go here. So what, what I focused on today was just cooling towers trying to cool that water right down to the coldest temperature. However, sometimes you don't want it that cold because you, if, if you know what's on the other side of this loop, that can be the driving force, right? So this just assumed you want to cold the water, chill the water, cool it down as much as possible. But let's say you had a chiller over here, 
right? You had some process equipment that said, oh, we need to control it and not get it as cold as possible, but we want it to be 55. And let's say the wet bulb would be 39. So let's say theoretically you could get 39 here, but you don't want it 39. You need it to be 55 for the other side of the process. Well, how do you do that? You still spread the water, but you control that fan. So you can control the speed of this fan to make sure the sump doesn't get colder than 55. And you control the speed of that fan by putting a VFD on it or gears or whatever device you want to control speed. Typically a VFD is the way to go, a variable frequency drive. Uh, but you, there are many ways you can control this. I'm just working on a project where this is the limiting factor. We need to maintain 60 degrees on the tower. They don't have a VFD. We cycle this fan on off. Now we're short cycling the crap out of that fan. So we're going to recommend an improved process control on it, but we don't need to run that fan all the time. We're basically short cycling that fan uh, at 33%. So it's on for 20 seconds off for 40 seconds on, off, on, off. It does it all day long. And that's bad for the motor. So if you find a short cycling fan, a VFD is great. We can spin it continuously at 33% or 20 Hertz. The other side of it is how much water you want to send. Now, if this fan is running at full speed and let's say this tower was sized for 300 gallons per minute and you say, well, I can only send a hundred gallons. Remember the surface area remains the same. You will get closer to the approach, but not colder, wet bulb, if you slow the fan, if you slow the pump down and only push a hundred gallons through here. So where am I going with that? You may find that you have three cooling towers in a row and they're all sized for 300 GPM each. That is on your design summer condition day when it is 100 degrees outside and 40% humid. You're running a cooling tower in the middle of winter, right? And, you're, and you, you still have the same BTUs, but you can achieve that by using two cooling towers instead of three. So you can reduce the flow or you can use all three and not use the fan, right? It's about that surface area. It's, it's, it's like that chimney stack at the nuclear plant. There's lots of ways to improve the performance of your cooling towers and save energy by leveraging what you value more. Do you value chemical treatment more? Do you value electrical energy more? It's gonna vary from customer to customer. In many cases, they, the cost of chemical can exceed the cost of electricity. So they may opt for using more electricity and less chemical. So, so I know the focus typically for my company, for the IAC is electric, but when you sit down and have a conversation with the, with the property owner, they may come to you and say, no, we don't like that because the cost of chemical is 10X or that we have to do filtration of the water and that, that kills us, right? Uh, so that, that's another thing. Another thing growing, uh, going on in Utah right now with the drought that we faced is that the move away from cooling towers to air-cooled condensers is a very valid recommendation. And now you're actually going to increase energy use because you don't have the advantage of wet bulb temperature. You're working on dry bulb, but we have a more precious commodity that we care about in a drought condition, water. So you may, in some of your audits, find some resistance to water-cooled condensers. There's nothing more efficient than water-cooled towers. Okay, don't get me wrong, but there's there's the opposite side of it, the, the reality of it that you have to be aware of as well. So we have a question in the chat. Does putting cooling towers in series provide colder water because the wet bulb temperature gets lower with each pass-through? I'm no. wondering if someone, oh, well, okay. <laughs> Sorry. See if someone else, can someone else say why i'm, I'm wondering why um, does putting cooling towers in yeah i i can answer that if sunny wants to take a break well, for a second go ahead um, 
the air that you're using for each one is going to be the same temperature each time because you're pulling it from outside. Um, if you, the only way that you would end up with colder water is if for some reason your first one wasn't working properly and then you put it through one that was. Um, but the air that's coming in is going to be the same temperature. So you have the same wet bulb temperature for each because you start with the same dry bulb and the same humidity. It's coming from the same atmosphere. Yeah, and that your wet bulb is going to change maybe on locate depending on location or altitude or things like that, not because of a, a smaller configuration. Yeah, and, and your wet bulb typically around a particular location is not going to change within five feet. So now wet bulb at the University of Utah campus is the same at the football stadium as it is at the Huntsman Cancer Institute, right? It's not going to change in that 30 two mile as the crow flies. I have another question. Um, yes, if the air outside is like 12 degrees Fahrenheit, it's super cold and you're running your cooling tower, is your wet bulb temperature gonna be warmer than your dry bulb temperature? No, but you will start building ice. So you, you, do, have, you do have issues there. Um, they do have they do have electric resistance heating. Uh, you will you will um, you will actually most likely not need to use a cooling tower at that point. Uh, you may if it is for process control, you're probably just doing a fluid cooler at that point, and you're just going to run a tube bundle outside, and the cold air outside will cool it by itself. Uh, it it would be very surprised if you're using a cooling tower in that condition. You'd be using a fluid cooler, which is the, the lock tube bundle. I have a question real quick also, kind of in conjunction with what Alex was asking. Could you like, Mm -hmm. have a cooling tower and then get the exhaust air like the air out and put that air into another cooling tower as the intake so then the parameters of the air are different so it's at a different temperature or humidity and then that would allow you to then somehow cool the water lower so i'm not really sure how that would work but now, is that what people do as soon as you increase the humidity um hold on one second See if I can pull up an online psycho chart. Here Sonny we go. could talk psychrometrics all day. Once Don't you get it, it, once you get it, you're set. Okay. So let's let's find something here that works. Come on. Can you see my screen? Do you see the engineering toolbox screen? Yeah, yeah. it's pretty tiny. But we it's pretty it. yeah, it's pretty tiny. Uh, the other way. Okay, so psychrometrics is basically, so here's your dry bulb. And each of these lines is your humidity. Okay, the curved lines. See that? If you keep your dry bulb the same, okay, you keep your dry bulb the same, you will notice that a dry bulb of 65 at the 100% humidity has the same wet bulb temperature, 65. So the more you increase the humidity, the closer you will get to the dry bulb temperature. So when it is 65 and 10, your dry bulb, your wet bulb is going to be, go up that way. You're going to be, what, something like, you know, 20 or whatever that has to be, right? 50, you're going to be 48, okay? If I increase it, 65 and 20, or 40, just to illustrate, I'm at 55 or 52. So for a given dry bulb temperature, as you increase humidity, Nathan, which is basically that exhaust stack, because that exhaust stack is, is increasing humidity, you are going to get warmer and warmer air coming out. So, so psychrometric says that you cannot do what you just said, because that humidity is going to be at 80% roughly, right? Okay. So now you basically got 60 degree air. 
So mm -hmm. now you're pushing 60, uh, 60 degree dry bulb and 80% humidity. So you've just killed yourself. Okay, that makes sense, thank you. Okay. So piggybacking off the last question, would putting cooling towers in series reduce your approach temp? Who's going to take that one up? Someone's got to have understood this. I think Andrew responded to this. No, good job, Matthew. You want to explain, Matthew? Um, it's very similar to what was <clears throat> basically already been said is uh, you still have the same atmosphere surrounding the cooling tower, whether you have a hundred of them or just one. Um, your approach is going to be your approach and your wet bulb is going to be your wet bulb and uh, that's what you have to deal with. Good job. Anybody else? Yeah, Any just kind questions? of an additional thing. If you want to improve your approach, that's when you have to go into physically checking the fan to make sure it's working right and checking the media to make sure it's not plugged and checking your flow rate to make sure it's not too high for the system and that kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah, that's where the maintenance starts coming into play. So I guess going off of my previous thought process of um, in order to reduce your approach, you'd have to change the cooling towers. Like if you had two cooling towers that were exactly the same and you basically put them through each other, it wouldn't change anything because your approach would be the same. Yes, but you, you can add a few things to an existing cooling tower to improve the approach. Okay. So you don't have to completely change it, but you can do some aftermarket installs to improve its performance. But if you put it through, like, I guess your approach temperature, it's, if you can change it by, you know, increasing the efficiency of the tower, mm -hmm. uh, um, but putting it through in the atmosphere around it doesn't change. So your wet bulb temperature would stay the same, but would you decrease it a little bit more getting it close, like the wet bulb temperature or yeah, would you'd it get it closer to the wet bulb thing? You'd get it closer to the wet bulb temperature. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That was what I guess I was kind of asking was That's even true. though the atmosphere is pretty much staying the same you would slowly get closer and closer to the wet bulb temperature. If you if, were just if recycling, you, if you were just recycling the water and not adding extra heat to it and just, just looping it through, yes, you would. Okay, perfect. Sonny and James, I'm gonna jump in just because we are at 515. So we are past class time. I appreciate your extra time. And obviously um, you've done a great job of engaging um, the team in, in interesting topics. So thank you. Um, I'm going to actually wrap it up by asking you one last question, and then we'll continue next week. Um, mm -hmm. I was curious, Sonny, have you had direct experience with Dolphin or other alternative uh, treatment systems? And if so, is there a cost benefit analysis? Is there a cost benefit argument? Dolphin? I don't, I don't even know what that is. First time I'm hearing about that. OK, fair <coughs> enough. Yeah. We'll table that question for for now and um, say you say thank you again uh, for this week and we'll we'll uh, continue next week. Perfect. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you.